This is a tartan tracksuit. This is a tartan dressing table. And this is a four or five hundred year old piece of bog tartan. This is Bannockburn. As a matter of fact, this is the Bannockburn. But we're not here to talk about what happened in 1314. Today we're more interested in this place behind me, believe it or not, being a hub of industry and arguably the birthplace of the modern tartan industry. A couple of weeks ago I made a video about the Sobieski Stewards and their great tartan con. How they invented a ton of tartan history and a good few clan tartans. In the video I said that clan tartans are a fairly new thing. But where did it all begin? Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the history of tartan and tartan mania. First of all, what actually is tartan? Tartan-like patterns intersecting horizontal and vertical lines definitely aren't a new thing. Tartan sometimes gets called plaid, but in Scotland a plaid is actually a big bit of tartan cloth. The word plaid can be used to describe any crisscrossing pattern. All tartans are plaids, but not all plaids are tartan. Examples of tartan-like patterns have been found in Xinjiang in China that date back somewhere around 3,000 years. But tartan as we know it, the Scottish kind, is quite specific. There are rules. Of course there are. The pattern or set has to follow the same order in both directions, and it has to be symmetrical. The bars and stripes are true colours, and they form half-tones where the colours cross. Tartan should have a name and a community attached. It could be a family name or a country or even a football team. It just has to belong. The word tartan possibly comes from the French tartine. I think I pronounced that correctly. I didn't. It refers to a particular kind of cloth. The oldest sample of Scottish tartan is this one found in a bog in Glenafric and dated to sometime in the 16th century. The dyes were analysed and reproduced last year, and now we know what it looked like. In fact, you can buy it. The earliest written reference we have to the word is in the 1532 and 33 accounts of the Treasurer of Scotland. For, and I quote, another tartan coat given to the King by Master Forbes. I'm not entirely sure who Master Forbes was or why he was showering the King with tartan gifts, but we'll guess he was after some kind of favour. The earliest visual reference we have to Scottish tartan is in this 16th century painting, Ecossais Sauvage, or Savage Scotsman, by the Flemish painter Lucas de Heer. But unlike these days, it's his jacket that has all the pattern stuff on it, and it might not count as tartan because it's not quite complicated enough. He's not even wearing a kilt. If I didn't know better, I'd say he seems to be wearing denim cutoffs. This is a Highland Chieftain. That's the title of the painting. It's actually a painting of Lord Mungo Murray, who wasn't an actual Highland Chieftain at all. He was the fifth son of one, so kind of out of luck. It was painted in Ireland by the artist John Michael Wright, who was there to escape persecution for being Catholic. This would have been painted in the 1680s, and he's very definitely wearing what we'd recognise as tartan today. This is an engraving from 1631. It shows Scottish soldiers also wearing something resembling tartan. So tartans have been around for a while, but they weren't clan tartans. Hand weaving is a real skill, and it's expensive. In any given area, there would only have been a handful of weavers. Obviously this was well before the days of mass consumerism. Weavers weren't going to look up your family tree and find out which tartan you had the right to wear. They would have had a fairly limited repertoire, meaning that a lot of people in the area would have worn the same tartan, regardless of what their second name was. Following the Jacobite uprising of 1745, the act of prescription forbade the wearing of kilts and most tartan garments between 1747 and 1782. The ban was only active in certain highland counties and didn't apply to the gentry, women or people serving in the military. They were quite specific about it. From or after the 1st day of August 1747, no man or boy within that part of Britain called Scotland 
other than such as shall be employed by officers and soldiers in His Majesty's forces, shall, on any pretext whatever, wear or put on clothes commonly called Highland clothes, that is to say, the plaid, the filly bag, or little kilt, trous, shoulder belts, or any part whatever of what particularly belongs to the Highland garb, and that no tartan or parti-coloured plaid of stuff shall be used for great coats or upper coats. Tartan might not have outright been banned, but it was effectively banned by the fact they covered all the bases. But the military and the gentry still needed their kilts. The reason I'm in Bannockburn is this place, the site of the old William Wilson Mills. This has only recently been excavated by archaeologists. You can see the drainage pipe sticking out of the ground there. There's not much left of it now, but from around the late 18th century, this place was a hub. William Wilson founded his business in 1665. Bannock Burns in the Lowlands, seen by the British government as being sympathetic to the Crown, so he was free to produce his tartan and things really took off. He supplied tartan to the Highland regiments of the British Army. They standardised colours and patterns to make things more consistent. It's said that the burn would run different colours, reds, yellows, greens, depending on what they were dyeing on a given day. They'd name tartans after areas or towns, which is kind of consistent with the localised tartan that would have happened before. Then they started using family names towards the end of the 18th century, and in 1819 they put together a reference manual. In 1778, the Highland Society of London was formed for clan chiefs to meet up. A lot of them would have been living at their city addresses. One of the club, Colonel Alexander Macdonnell of Glengarry, was on a mission, and he pestered them all to give him a piece of their own clan tartan, validated with their own seals, so that they could be preserved for posterity. But, and here's where things come full circle, a lot of the tartans actually originated here, in the Wilson factory. In 1822, George IV famously came to Edinburgh. He was the first reigning monarch to visit in 150 years, and it was a big deal. Everything was painstakingly choreographed by the writer, Sir Walter Scott. His work fed a newfound romantic ideal of Highland life, and the biggest symbol of that was the kilt. Walter Scott wanted everyone in tartan, and that boosted what would later become tartan fever. Everyone who was anyone wanted to be seen in a kilt, and they wanted it to be their own family tartan. Wilson's up production and attributed tartans to family names. There are even records of certain tartans that had their names changed to fit with whoever they were supplying them to. Later, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert would buy Balmoral and go Highland daft. Scotland had been rebranded and given a tartan paint job. These days, tartans everywhere. And while it might have gone global, this quiet place is where it really took off.